Today on You Be The Judge. If you slip and fall, can you really sue and easily win? Go inside a real life slip and fall claim and see what a judge looks for when determining who is at fault. We'll show you the facts and let you be the judge. While the idea of slipping, falling, suing, and winning is often joked about, if you are the one left with the medical bills, you may want to know if the property owner played a role in the accident. How does a slip and fall claim work? First, who do you sue? The defendant will most likely be the property owner or manager. The defendant has a duty to keep their premises reasonably safe from hazard. Number two, did the defendant breach their duty and were damages caused as a result? In other words, was the property owner, manager, or an employee somehow neglectful by causing or creating the dangerous situation, knowing about it but not doing anything to prevent it, or if they didn't know about the danger, should they have known? Not only must you prove that the defendant breached their duty, you must also prove what is called proximate cause, which says that the injuries were the result of that specific accident. 3. Did the defendant act reasonably? If someone trips over an object left on the floor, was there good reason for the object's position or could it have been easily and reasonably moved before anyone could trip on it? Did the property owner take precautions to minimize danger? How long was the danger present prior to the accident? Number four, was the injured person acting carelessly? Everyone has a duty to protect themselves and to be careful. Would another person in the same situation notice and avoid the danger? Was there a legitimate reason that the person was on the property? Had the owner placed a barrier or warning sign for the danger? Was the injured person engaged in activities that could increase the chance of slipping and falling? For example, texting while walking. In a slip and fall lawsuit, both sides will attempt to prove that the other was at least partially at fault. In some states, there is contributory negligence. This is where if the plaintiff is in any way at fault, they cannot recover damages. Other states have comparative negligence. If the plaintiff is partially at fault, that percentage is subtracted from any award. Finally, some states allow for compensation if you are less than 50% at fault, but none if you are more than 50% at fault. Ultimately, the injured person bears the greatest burden of proof. Now we'll go inside an abbreviated, real-life claim, present the facts, and ask you to make a ruling. Then in the next episode, I'll reveal to you what the judge actually ruled. A woman we'll call Helen went with her husband to visit their son at a correctional facility. Helen entered and noticed someone nearby with a mop in hand, a bucket on the floor, and a caution sign. As she walked, she tried to stay on the carpet runner, and eventually stepped off to get to where she was going. At that point, she did not see any mops, buckets, or signs. As Helen stepped off, she slipped and fell to the floor. Helen's husband's foot slipped too, but he was able to avoid falling. The facility's standard policy was to put caution signs in a square around wet areas. Consider the previously mentioned criteria of slip and fall lawsuits. Number one, did the facility breach their duty to keep the premises reasonably safe from hazard? 2. Did the facility act reasonably? And 3. Was Helen careless? Now it's time for you to be the judge. Should the defendant be held responsible for all, part, or none of the accident? Share your ruling in the comment section. And look for part 2 of our slip and fall accident series to find out what the judge actually ruled.